Greetings, friends. Welcome, everyone. You are now joining our author live series right here on Amazon Live. I'm Albert Lawrence, and I am absolutely amped that you're here with us today. You have chosen the perfect place for you to click through for you to join, because today we have two powerhouses. That's right. You can count them. They're both sitting right above me right now in the screens. First off, we have legendary astrophysicist and acclaimed podcast host of Star Talk Radio, and of course, many more accolades. We've got Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hey, what's, what's up, up doctor? In the house. Okay, and then also we have award... <laughs> hey, we've got award-winning aerospace engineer and associate project manager at NASA, y'all. That's right, we have Dr. Wendy A. Okolo. Dr. Wendy, greetings to you. Happy to be here. <laughs> yes. And one of the cool things about this as well, too, is that you can find their latest books, including To Infinity and Beyond and Learn to Fly. Both of these books right now are available in the carousel. You'll find that carousel either next to or right below this video, depending on how you're joining us. But remember, we are live. So part of the joy of this being live is that if you happen to have a question, which I know you will, Go ahead, just type it in the chat, and then we're going to try to get to as many of these questions as we can during this interview. So this is a whole community thing. We need you in order to make this pop. So first off, let's get things popping. Uh, we're going to kick off with what we'll call some space hot topics, because if you are watching this stream, we already know that your mind is really, really primed to learn more about what's happening in space, what's happening right here, and what's happening all around us. So uh, first off, I want to throw out the topic of aeronautics. Um, what's, what, what's the latest that's happening within aeronautics? What is really uh, taking over some of the headlines right now in aeronautics? And we can either start with you, Dr. Tyson, or with you, Dr. Okolo. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to go, you know. Um, I mean, aeronautics is... I mean, it's it's just taking off right now. There there are just so many things. For one, advanced air mobility is one hot topic, and that is really just the ability to make air travel more autonomous. Right? You want people to be able to fly in things like air taxis, but not just to carry passengers, but to carry like you know small goods and transport you know things that are critical safely. Um, in a number of places. I mean, you have people using drones for, or UAVs for agriculture in parts of Africa. You have people using them to um, determine how best to water plants and when the best time is. You have people using them to do things like irrigating an area or to drop um, insecticides and things that can help prevent malaria in, in certain parts of the world. So you have so many public good use cases for small and large vehicles that can fly autonomously, even wildfires, right? Determining how best to handle wildfires. I mean, we talk about climate change and all of the things that are changing right now and how can you use a UAV or a drone to determine how best to tackle a fire. Um, you also have supersonic flight, which is a hot topic now in aeronautics where, I mean, it takes us, what, six hours to go from California to, to DC, right? Six whole hours. And we have the capability to be able to go in under two hours. It's just noisy. So you have different groups working on reducing that noise, reducing that sonic boom that will allow us to fly faster and get to places quicker and you know in very very different ways so we're just trying to make greater use of our airspace um that is currently predicated on a you know world war ii era and just utilize it more for good so there's supersonics there's advanced air mobility there's there's just a lot more to make things cleaner faster and better Are you saying that we we can actually mm. get rid of there's a way to get rid of the sonic boom like there's some fancy flaps or something that that that, that can diffuse it because I, I, that, I think that was the only reason why we didn't just keep supersonic planes in the arsenal, right? So, so uh, is there a future of no sonic boom at all? There is a future of very, very reduced. And there are different ways, because it's really just pressure buildup, right? You know, it's just this pressure waves that are building when, and, and they kind of catch up with each other when you fly supersonically. But for example, NASA's Quest is trying to elongate like the very, very front of the aircraft so that it pushes and kind of separates those pressure waves a little further out. Um, the idea is to make it palatable, 
right? Acceptable enough, good enough, right? Because perfect is the enemy of good. So if people find that noise decent enough, you know, acceptable enough, we'll move with it. We'll do what we can. But currently, you know, the military is flying I mean, jet aircrafts at supersonic speeds. That's been happening. It's just that we cannot fly commercial airliners over the continental United States at supersonic speeds. And of course, that's the first A in NASA, right? Aeronautics, mm. right? National Aeronautics. Thank you. And so people forget that. People forget that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you for reminding us that you know that NASA is mm -hmm. with you when you fly, literally. So it's there's Aero, yeah. there's Astra, but Aero's Aero's been there. It's been there. Give it a little a little more love. And also, if I remember correctly, um, those little this flaps is... at the ends of the ends of the wings that stick upwards, that that reduces the aerodynamic drag on what was previously a traditional wing. And that's, I understand, credited to NASA. NASA has made flying yes. more efficient just from that little wingtip ends that we all see now. Exactly, exactly. Even, I mean, even the flaps on the trailing edges of the wings, right? All of that and, because it's really, it's, it's a body, it's a shape that you want to be more aerodynamically efficient based on how it's designed. So there are certain conditions, there are certain regimes that you're flying in that you want your flaps to be deflected a certain way. And there are other regimes that you want them deflected another way so that you can reduce drag. So those flap, next time you're on a plane and you see things move up and down or, you know, they're literally called control surfaces. They're being controlled. They're not, you know, just moving of their own volition, of their own accord. Um, so yeah, NASA, NASA, NASA has made uh, quite a bit of uh, significant improvement in, in error and making things. I'm possible. glad to know the flaps are not moving at random. That feels good to me. Yes. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> thanks, thanks for yeah. that reassurance there. Bro. <laughs> yeah, they're not. They're not. That's good. Oh gosh. Well, Dr. Wendy, uh, this intrigues me for multiple reasons, but one of the reasons is because it sounds as though we're getting closer to my dream of just teleportation. You know, we might not have physically <laughs> figured out how to make that happen, but at least by reducing the amount of time we have to be in the sky before we get to our destination, this is a good thing. Yes, agreed. Life is short. Life is short. Let's not spend it in metal tubes when we can, you know, go faster. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Now, now, Dr. Tyson, I've got something for you. Um, speaking of, you know, hurling ourselves through the air, I know that there are often are things that are hurling through space um, that we have a little bit less control over versus what we're controlling. I would say airplanes. we have no uh, control. Can you talk, tell us we a little bit no about... We have no control of anything <laughs> hurling through space. Not just less control. Now, continue. Continue your question. Okay. <laughs> no. So, so of these things, and of course, like not to alarm us at all, um, but but what's happening? What's going on up there that maybe we should be aware of, and should we be bracing for any it's sort of impact? It's a shooting gallery, first of all. All right. Do you know Earth plows mm. through mm. hundreds of tons of meteors a day, a day, and you experience some of that at nighttime. You wouldn't see it in the daytime. At nighttime, many of those meteors burn up, and we call them shooting stars. OK, that's just we, we say, oh, look, a beautiful shooting star. Well, a few of those are big and some are really big and a really big one took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That one was the size of Mount Everest. So you want to know NASA has an entire branch of itself concerned with tracking asteroids that are wayward, that are not nicely contained in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Many of those asteroids, uh, I forgot what percent of them, 10%, uh, uh, many, uh, maybe not that high, but uh, uh, there's a significant fraction, especially if they hit you, it's significant, that whose orbits cross the orbit of the Earth. And if it, an orbit crosses the orbit of the Earth, mm. then the orbital dynamics are such that it will eventually strike Earth. It's just a matter of when. So I'd like to be able to deflect asteroids, but we can't do that right now. NASA had the DART mission, double asteroid redirect test, where there was a little orbiting moonlit, and because you have very precise measurements of, of how long it took the moonlit to go around the asteroid, we slammed into that to see if we can change the orbital period, and we did, by much more than we had expected. So that's a good start, all right? But in all the headlines in the last couple of days, there's the asteroid Bennu. Bennu is 500 meters across, something like that. 
uh, bigger than the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower. Um, and the headlines, because it makes clickbait, is Bennu might hit Earth in the year 21, whatever, 50, 67, something like that. Well, what do they mean by May? Well, chances are one in, at the moment, one in 2,700. Okay. So uh, the fact that the headline says May hit Earth gets you to click on it, and then you see the actual numbers. So we have to agree with ourselves as to when we should have the right to use the word may hit us. Okay? Is it 1 in 3? 1 in 10? Mm. Is it mm. 1 in 2,700? Does that count as it may hit us? It sounds a little, a, a little mm. you know, hyperbolic to me. But anyhow, so that's, mm. so that's in the sky right now. But yeah, just always look up. <laughs> okay. And that, you know, it's interesting, uh, Neil, that, that area of kind of watching out and keeping an eye out for things that may hit us is called planetary defense. How cool is that, right? Defending our planet from known and, you know, potentially unknown unknowns. So um, you should look up the DART mission. It was, it was it's pretty awesome to be able to see if potentially this small, almost infinitesimal change in you know the trajectory of an asteroid could translate to you know it avoiding avoiding um avoiding us here on earth so thanks for sharing right. and that date is is november 2182 so if we were certain an asteroid would strike us of that magnitude that far in the future that's plenty of time to mount some kind of defense system to help to help this out so yeah so nasa has been thinking about this and concerned about it though is at the moment powerless to do anything about it so wendy the fact that they call it the defense <laughs> they can't actually <laughs> defend us they, they just say you know, kiss your rear end goodbye uh on that date unless somebody does something about it because you know you know that if the dinosaurs had a space program they would have deflected that <laughs> asteroid and they'd still be here conducting this interview and we'd be running underfoot trying to not get eaten by T-Rex. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. I know that we're going to get a chance to get into this, uh, some of what I'm thinking about right now, a little bit later on, especially as we dive into both of your books. But I know that Hollywood seems to be just obsessed. We are so obsessed with this idea of, you know, needing to defend ourselves from things that are hurling towards us, whether we're talking about, uh, what was, a, was there a movie called like 2012, or um, even when we think about aliens, right? When we think about uh, extraterrestrials. So last question before I start jumping into the tons of viewer chat questions that we're getting. By the way, y'all who are tuning in live, thank you so much for writing these questions. I'm gonna try my best to get to uh, as many of these as possible. Um, but we gotta talk about UFOs real quick. Um, Congress, UFO hearings, our eyes have just been glued to, to reading these headlines. But for those of us maybe who've read the headlines but didn't really get into, into the real guts of what's happening here, um, is there anything that's truly substantial, anything um, that's fresh that we're learning about for the first time that we should, you know, pay attention to? Um, I'm going to start with you on this one, Dr. Tyson. Uh, well, I, I let me start out by saying it seems to me that if aliens were visiting earth aliens intelligent aliens from another planet that we would not need congressional hearings to establish whether or not that was true that, that that's just my that's just me all right mm. you know cuz <laughs> at any moment uh there are a million people who are airborne have a nice window to the side of them and everybody's got a a a smartphone high resolution camera and video. And so it seems to me if mothership started showing up, it, the internet would be covered with them. You know, cat videos go viral where a cat, a kitten trying to jump from a couch to a chair and it drops to the ground, that goes viral. <laughs> you know, if somebody had high resolution video, it would be viral instantly. So, so I go in there with a high dose of skepticism. All right, so now um, there are people testifying that I'm paraphrasing here, that they have aliens in a back room, okay? And that, but you, nobody can see them, and you need top secret, higher than top secret clearance. No member of Congress has seen it. So, okay. Um, in science, if you have a discovery, 
you share that discovery. Let other people test it. If you have bi biologics, then br let biologists test it in their separate labs. We did that with Apollo. We brought back Apollo rocks and shared yes. those rocks with the world. Labs all over. That's how you establish mm. something that is objectively true in science. You don't just listen to one person who is sworn to tell the truth and say, oh my gosh, we've really been visited by aliens. That's not how you establish an extraordinary uh, truth, that which that would be if it were the case. Now, I'm going to do a handoff to Wendy because I know that NASA created a committee to study these lights in the sky and objects in the sky. And uh, Wendy, do you know if NASA plans to be a clearinghouse for people's observations? Because every every a smartphone video or frame, you have the, the longitude, latitude, the you know, there you have the what do they call it the the macro information for those um, for that photo, and you can be very effective compiler of these data in case there is something that we have to investigate. I mean, just excellent, excellent question and lead in. There is now a NASA team that's been you know stood up to investigate and speak to and you know try to communicate clearly right, the findings of these UAPs. So they're unidentified aerial phenomena, that's what they're called. And there's a report that's publicly available, right? It's, it's open to, to anyone, just, just Google it and, and you can find that. And right after the table of contents, there's a picture in that report of two things, you know, kind of coming down that look like what they've told us aliens are. And when I say they, I mean Hollywood, right? What popular culture has told us what aliens are. But those two things are actually what they call red sprites caused by lightning, right? There are phenomena that, you know, when certain kinds of lightning happen, they cause those red sprites. And they just have not been photographed to that level, to that quality in the way that they are, you know, they're being shown in that report, lightning lightning so you know you know and, and and the findings that you know if you look at kind of like the executive summary of the report what they say is really that you know it's it's great to point out and identify and share these things and particularly to advance science to advance research when you come up on something you want to share it with the world such that researchers other scientists can even take it a little further than you have been able to they can make it better they can potentially find something that benefits all of humankind, right? Versus hide it away. So what that report is kind of encouraging is to work together kind of like, you know, as a, a crowdsourcing form. So if you look at something called ASRS, the Aviation Safety Reporting System, that is a database that anyone flying, even a drone, a little hobbyist, anything, can report potential safety incidents and accidents that could now inform feed into mitigation techniques for safety, right? If this is something that you're seeing happen pervasively and pervasively, then someone can take that data, look at the likelihood of occurrence, look at, you know, the potential criticalities of it and see how they can develop something that mitigates it. This can be applied to the sightings of UAPs, right? Unidentified aerial phenomena or aliens or whatever you think. If we can crowdsource and share this information, right? You don't even know what this could advance. It might not necessarily be, oh yeah, there's an alien and a mothership that's coming to take all of us away. But this potentially could inform other, you know, areas of science, areas of research that could make our lives better. So just because you see something, does it, you know, don't go crazy about it or don't speak or potentially speculate on one you know that it is. Share it, share the pictures, share the data, right? And see it could advance other things. I'm not saying we are or we are not the only life form, but I agree with Neil in that if there's an alien in a back room <laughs> somewhere, there is so much research <laughs> and science that we want out of it, right? And we're not just going to leave it in that back room. And, and by the way, the Mark. UAP, wow. that's just the government okay. rebranding UFO. Who are they fooling? Yeah. Yeah. Right? They, 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 it's UFO. It's just <laughs> they're just rebranding it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Now, see, look, oh, wait, 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 we could have spent the entire hour wait, wait, just wait, 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 oh, wait, go for wait, it. Wait, I go got for it. my big, my biggest <laughs> takeaway from the hearings. 
my biggest takeaway was, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. AOC is on the same panel as staunch Republicans, and they're cooperating in their inquiry. Oh my gosh, I've never seen that. So, 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 so maybe we need an alien invasion to bring the houses, to bring the, the liberals and conservatives together in Congress. To me, that was the biggest positive effect of that whole thing. Just thought I'd say that. Oh, gosh. Um, well, look, and again, see, we could have dug even deeper into that, but you two know I have to get to your books at some point during this stream, right? I promise. I promise that we would talk about your books um, at some point. Um, but before we jump into the books, let's go to uh, our viewers who have just been throwing questions in the chat. Every time that either one of you has said another thing, it's sparked another fleet of questions. So let's get to those. Um, this is a speed of light you know, round of questions. So because of that, I'm going to ask that each of you, let's try to keep our responses maybe to just like a couple sentences just so that we can speed on sound, through these You want ones, sound bites. I'm ready for you. Danny, <laughs> perfect, perfect. You know what we're doing. So Danny Urbanowitz asks, why is everyone so excited to go to Mars when Venus is a living planet and is closer to Earth? Oh, I got this. Um, ready? Let's I got see, uh, Dr. Tyson, why don't you start ready? off with this one? Okay. okay. I calculated on Venus, you can take a 16 inch pizza, put it on the windowsill, and it will cook in seven seconds. Okay. And then I found out from someone geekier than I was that I had neglected the radiant heat of the atmosphere itself, that it would actually cook in three seconds. Oh. So Venus is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't want to go to Venus. All right. So just start there. And Mars oh, no. rotates once in 24 hours. It's tipped on its axis. It has polar ice caps the way we do at this moment. It sort of still do. And so Mars has evidence of liquid running water on its surface. Not today, but it, for long ago. It probably went to a permafrost. It is the most likely next place we would ever want to be. But don't forget that Antarctica is, is balmier and wetter than the surface of Mars, and nobody's lining up to go live on Antarctica. So we, we'd want to terraform it or something before you mm. went there. But that's why. And it's not, it's not that much farther away uh, from an orbital dynamics perspective. Yeah. Water water is a big deal. Water gotcha. is a big deal. So okay, you know how we see on Earth, follow the money. What? With exploration, we want to follow the water, okay? Because you can mm. drink it, you can do things with it, and you can make fuel from it. You can split it. You know, until hydrogen used to make fuel to go and explore other planets. So that's another reason I want to go to the moon. Yes, yeah, one of NASA's big mantras. That's right. Follow mm. the water. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, since you just brought up the moon, uh, that flows with an uh, and flows with water. Um, this goes with another question that someone just asked. Um, is the moon hollow? Is the moon hollow? So, Dr. Okolo, I'm going to toss, toss this it right to, to, to Neil. <laughs> Anything okay, I got you. Ask me some technology ready? questions. So, yeah. Okay, I got this. I got this. I got this. Ready? <laughs> okay. Um, the movie Armageddon was the top of my list for the movie that violated the most number of laws of physics per minute of any film I had ever seen until I saw Moonfall. Okay, which came out during COVID, Moonfall. <laughs> that, that is a hollow moon with an alien moon creature living inside. And so, no, all evidence tells us that the moon is not hollow. It's a solid object. It's lighter for what it is than other objects that size because it doesn't have an iron, uh, there's not much iron in it, which led us to suspect that it was created by a side swipe of Earth in the early solar system, scooping up our crust and mantle, which is very low in iron content, making a fresh object that we call the moon out of material skimmed off of the surface of the, of the Earth. So, no, there's no evidence that it's hollow at all, hmm. other than what you see in Hollywood movies. Okay, so now let me tack onto that, right? Just gotcha. something with that shape, the planets, mm -hmm. anything that has even just a little gravity, things... And that's why they're round, right? Because things really concentrate and are pulled in to the center. So as we stand here on Earth or sit, we are being attracted, right, to the center. So 
the odds of that center being hollow are slimmer than none. Okay. Um, <laughs> just, 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 just. No, I like that. So what you're saying that, is yeah. everything yeah. wants to go to the center. So, everything. so, to, so the last place you expect the hollow yeah. room to exist is in the center of any cosmic object. I'm with yes. you. Great, perfect way to say that. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, now, after your answer about Venus versus Mars, we actually have a follow-up question that's coming from our people. Wait, can uh, we tell their know, names? Are you allowed yes, to... Yes, we get it that Venus Can you say their hot. names? Do we get to know who they are? Yeah, give them the name, <laughs> okay. check them. Okay, sh sure. For sure. Now, now, this one just got tossed on in, so I don't know which name is attached to this one, but for the others, I'll continue to try mm -hmm. to uh, get their names. Oh, this, okay, no, this is from Danny. Danny, it's from Danny, okay? Um, so Danny, as a follow-up to the Venus one, says, look, we get it, Venus is hot, but could we live in Venus's atmosphere if there were some sort of blimp that was hovering over? Danny is really trying to advocate <laughs> for Venus today, y'all. Yeah, so Venus is 900 <laughs> degrees on the surface, and the temperature slowly drops as you ascend. And by the way, it's also 100 times the air pressure you have here on Earth. So you would vaporize and be squashed simultaneously. So you can, in principle, find a place Ooh. in the Venus atmosphere that is a pressure that won't kill you and a temperature that won't vaporize you. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. You want to live in a balloon? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I want terra firma, okay? All right. If you're a balloon person, I don't want to stop you. But yeah, and and there it is. you have to promise that if you do it, you go live there. We don't want to hear any complaints. All of the complaints <laughs> we've been hearing you've been duly... all summer <laughs> about it duly being hot. Warm. Everyone's complaining about the heat this summer. I don't want to hear it when they hear weed of heats. And by the way, the heat of Venus is a runaway <laughs> greenhouse effect from the the very significant concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere what we are now adding to our atmosphere so there are knobs that have been turned on other planets mm. that uh the comparative planetology mm. is people say why are we studying the planets when we should be studying earth when deep insights can come to you from planets that have gone bad That's and true. so never mm. stop looking up yeah mm. okay now, look, this next question, especially in regards to never stopping looking up, uh, people are never stopping looking forward as well, too, because T wants to know, do you think there will be another space race? And if so, who do you think will win? SpaceX, NASA, or maybe even China? Now, I know that at least one of you probably, you know, it's hard to be objective with this question, um, but, but, but I'm just tossing it out there because T wants to know. Wendy, you have anything to add here before I jump all over this? Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, there, there are these comparisons. <laughs> the thing with, with all these comparisons is that we're, we're playing in very different spaces, right? Um, NASA is not SpaceX. NASA is not trying to be SpaceX. NASA will never try to be SpaceX and vice versa. Um, we have a lot of heritage, a lot of legacy, a lot of research. We work in very, very different models, right? Um, and are very long-term different. So we're not in competition. And I, I, I think it's important. It's, it's critical that we know that. Especially you as people need to understand the different lanes, the swim lanes that these different you know, um, entities play and how well they work together. They work very, very well together. So I would take out, you know, the federal agency, NASA, from those kinds of comparisons with, with space race. So if you're going to ask the question about the countries, then I'll, I'll let um, Neil, Neil chime in. Yeah, so um, a couple of things. Okay, uh, we, we, as Americans, we have this memory of the space era of the <laughs> 1960s that's a little bit cleansed of reality, all right? The Russians, the Soviet Union, had the first satellite, the first non-human animal, the dog Laika. They had the first human. They had the first female. They had the first black person who was a Cuban. All right, Remember, Cuba was part of their sphere of influence. They beat us at everything in space and we have to say to ourselves well we got to find something we can so we get to the moon before they do and then we said we win 
And it's like, oh, okay. Okay. Well, they beat us at every other checkpoint along the way. All right. So you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to win a space race? All right. So what is the space uh, race? Right, exactly. So, yeah, I think we feel a little bit of flame under our rear end by China making these overtures in space. Sure. Because we could have stayed on the moon in 1972. We didn't. Could have gone back in 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010. Did we? No. China says, let's put Taikonauts on the moon. All of a sudden, NASA's moon program is rejuvenated. And we have Artemis 1, 2, and 3 lined up. So we would be naive to not think that what's going on is a space race. But consider, we've already been to the moon. Okay, so if China goes back there, well, we, 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 we're we already there. Okay, so how about Mars? Hmm. I think, and Wendy, correct me if I'm wrong, NASA doesn't have a spaceship that can go to Mars, but a, a, a SpaceX is making one. And so the day the country decides, yeah, let's send astronauts to Mars, NASA's going to got to turn to Elon, say, Elon, you got a rocket to go to Mars? And he rolls one out of the shed. I, I think so. And, at the end of the day, Elon is the first one on Mars, but without tax money. That's that's my. Yeah. And, and that's already happening. Right. That's already happening in terms of those collaborations. Right. SpaceX is already sending U.S. astronauts to, you know, the ISS. And so those those things are already happening. And that's why I kind of wanted to hammer on that you know, delineation that it's not a race between SpaceX and a federal agency like NASA, right? These these organizations are working together to advance U.S. objectives and taxpayer dollar objectives. Mm. Okay. okay. Those aren't really well, sound bites. Maybe we can try to make it even shorter. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Let's try to make it shorter. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm really good at sound bites. I'm not in those no, no. examples, though. But yeah, I, okay, go. This next one's super duper short and brief for you. And I promise after this question, I'm going to get to your books. It's just this conversation between y'all and the folks in the chat is just so thrilling that I'm like, let's just keep on getting fan questions in. Uh, but here's one from Daniela. Daniela wants to know. What are your thoughts on the privatization of space and of a starship? So this really does flow exactly with what you both were just talking about right now. Uh, but here's an invitation, an opportunity to, to kind of like condense that into a soundbite. Privatization of space should have been happening starship. decades ago. We were it was possible. We NASA was just resistant mm. to it. The, you know, the whole myth, mythos of the right stuff. If someone just pay to go on, is that the right stuff? Because you had a fat wallet. You know, so there is some cultural divide there, but it should have been happening decades ago. We are witnessing the birth of an entire new industry called space tourism. I'm all for it. Yeah, I think I think it's a good thing. I do think that the government or, you know, someone has a role to play in ensuring or at least, you know, kind of keeping an eye out for equity right in that exploration and you know just not reduction in potential misuse right so when new territory is being charted the eth like i mean the onus is is on us the onus is on someone at least to keep an eye out for those checks and balances and making sure that it is equitable and we don't see that you know, a certain demographic of people is marginalized or is unable to benefit from that exploration. So it's a good thing, you know, the privatization is great and it's enabling and spurring competition and that competition is driving innovation in the development of technology. But we just want to make sure that it is equitable and equitable enough. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, I, like, I feel as though even though I can't hear rounds of, of applause coming through the chat, I know that people are sitting at their office or whatever. They're like, yes, you need yes, an applause yes. Button. Um, so thank you, you for that. Yes. We'll talk I know to Amazon. I really need that sound need effect. 
<laughs> insert here um but so now let's jump on and we're gonna we might get another chance to get some more questions in uh from the viewers right now but before we do that i really want us to get into these books because you both as well as your teams have really gone through quite a bit of work in order to make these books happen so we've got first off learn to fly which is written by Dr. Wendy A. Okolo right here. So if y'all are just now joining the stream, welcome. You got here just in time. And then also we have from Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson and Lindsay Nix Walker to Infinity and Beyond. Now these are both very different books, but they tie into curiosity, they tie into exploration, and they are just freaking motivating for us to be able to enjoy and to dig on into. So, Dr. Wendy, um, I want to invite you first off to share with everyone, tell us a little bit about Learn to Fly and what your inspiration was, why you felt as though you needed to write this book and that now was the time. For yeah, so thanks, Albert. This book is long overdue. I I'm just going to start with that. Long, long, long overdue. And it was really based on popular demand and in 2019 i got the black engineer of the year award for most promising engineer in u.s government and i got a number of awards after that i was grateful for them it was great i posted something on one of my social media accounts and i went viral and i went viral not just in the united states i mean i'm talking nigeria malawi the uk brazil Cote d'Ivoire. people started to send me messages in french Brazilian in Portuguese and I, I was like what, what's going on I was like okay mm. I have work and I have things to do and I, I don't have time for this but you know I would try to reply every so often and I started getting so many mentoring requests and that was the one that got me it's like can you mentor my daughter can you mentor my son and they're interested in aerospace and then I started to get people choosing to study aerospace engineering because of me that was humbling mm. and so getting asked to speak, you know, in very, very different spaces, right? And I, I share some of those spaces in, in the book, right? From Blue Origin to, you know, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists in Alberta. And just, they really caused me to reflect on my journey. And I realized that with being an aerospace engineer and achieving some of the things that I have achieved even before I got to NASA, and that's what this book is focused about, because this is not NASA work or NASA product. I realized that the rubber hits the road, rubber meets the road, particularly for people that aren't usually in the spaces, right? I mean, African-American, female, you know, underrepresented, young, whatever. The rubber meets the road in college, because I thought about the people that I started, you know, engineering with mm. that just didn't make it, that dropped out. And a lot of us know that story. A lot of us have heard that story. A lot of us know, oh, my dream was to be this. If I had my way, I would have been an aerospace engineer. If I had my way, I've been a, a medical doctor. And I just, I'm just, I'm just not smart enough. I'm not smart enough. I just couldn't do math. I'm like, really? What does that even mean? And so what Learn to Fly does is, it's funny, you know, it reflects on my journey in a, in, in a manner that's comical enough, but in a manner that encourages curiosity in aerospace, but in a manner that also equips anyone, regardless of background, to thrive, succeed in an academic career as rigorous as aerospace engineering, right? It tells you what to do when you get a D in calculus. Do you quit? Do you change majors? Or do you learn to fly? Okay, so here's where I need the both of you to work on creating a time machine because when I didn't do well in calculus, I did just change classes. I can, but but maybe if I would have had if I would have had learned to fly here and helped to motivate me, maybe I would have stuck it on out, Doctor Wendy. Um, <laughs> Um, now, Dr. Tyson, before I jump on it to, to infinity and beyond, I, I want to tell Dr. Wendy that we've got multiple people in the chat that are just kind of giving you a shout out. Uh, Ian is saying, Dr. Wendy is fantastic. Ali is saying, hello, Dr. Wendy. These folks have been flowing all throughout the chat. Um, but, but within your book right now, so in Learn to Fly, you have these things that you place in, and I'm gonna hold my book up to the screen real quick in case you guys might be able to see this. But there are these things that you call Learn to Fly <laughs> Nuggets, all right? So for example, here, you see a page, and you've got like a nugget like this right in the center of the page. Now, these 
these nuggets, they end up really imparting what I think are incredibly practical tips. So, like, some of them are how long should your resume be, you know, what classes to sign up for. But then, Dr. Wendy, you put some others in here that are more on the philosophical side. They, like, touch on concepts like being kind and trusting your gut. How did you narrow down which learn to fly nuggets that you were going to condense and to actually play? I know, I know. There's so many, right? There's so many. I think one of the drivers for yeah. for coming up with the nuggets was I wanted the things that are still applicable to me now, Wendy, the aerospace research engineer at NASA. And people that have read Learn to Fly are able to relate to so many different parts of it. It's not just for students. It's for people that need that reminder of, I mean, just how to move. So many times we get stuck in the bubble of just doing. We have this, we have that, we're working on A, B, and C, and we don't even take ourselves out of that bubble and see what's going on around us, right? We're just going through the motions because we have to do all of this. And sometimes it's important to be intentional about that reflection, and I try to do that now. I see something and, you know, show it to my husband and ask, babe, what what would you have done if this were you? And, and you know, what, how, how, how do you think I should handle this in the future? So I try to include the nuggets that are still applicable to, you know, 30, 40, 50 something year old, potentially Wendy, right? But the nuggets that were critical to Wendy's success in, you know, getting that aerospace engineering degree and that trusting your gut and being kind is still applicable today and being involved, you know, you're starting your career in biomedical engineering, right? And you don't know how to get a promotion, right? You feel stuck and you just don't know how people are moving and how people are doing it. Go get involved outside of your department, outside of your division. Mm. Go to the event for the employee resource group that is for women. You don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know who you're going to develop a relationship with. You don't know who will advocate for you behind closed doors in rooms that you are not aware of. So it's things like that. I try to think about what's applicable to me mm -hmm. now and try to include that and make it easy, easy enough to read. <laughs> so, so Wendy, this is a primer. This is a primer to, to navigate hurdles in life and challenges. Yeah. And, and so, you know, not many books are primers. Books are, yes. let me take you on this long story journey and like, but where's the nugget here? Well, you got to yeah. keep reading the 24 pages. And if you, if you isolated and sifted those nuggets, and slap them onto the page. Uh, this sounds very helpful to so many exactly. people who we both know might have just for lack of some nudge might have stayed with their ambitions, but took an off ramp and never returned. Exactly. You, you, you captured it so well, so eloquently. And if you are too busy, too slow to read the entire book, all of those nuggets are at the very end of the book, you know, or if you forget, or if you read it all and you're going through something, you forget. You go to the very back of the book and you see all of them, you know, concise, combined, and able for you to read in less than 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Wendy. Now, look, let me tell you what's going to take us more than 10 minutes to get through, however, <laughs> to infinity and beyond. Because, Dr. Tyson, y'all are trying to take the whole cosmos and put it into one book. <laughs> what in the world? This is a very, very ambitious piece. But at the same time, the the vocabulary, the words that are used, the pictures that are used, the vibrancy, it really does make this understandable. You're still boiling it down uh, while at the same time challenging us to look up and to think up. So tell me, Dr. Tyson, why? Why to infinity and beyond with everything else that you've written, everything else that you create? Why did you take the time in order to make First, this? First, you got you got to admit, it's a beautiful book. It, it's a beautiful looking book. You got... <laughs> It's so good. Just saying, uh, uh, it's it's beautiful because it's a it's co-produced with National Geographic, and you know that that's how they roll. They that they're a beautiful book operation. Just start with that. Um, it's heavily illustrated, a uh, three hundred and twenty pages heavily illustrated with uh, photos from the James Webb artwork where it's relevant to the narrative, images of objects, places, people, and things. Um, the book is it emanates from my podcast. And there are three DNA strands of the podcast. The podcast is called Star Talk. And it's the third book in collaboration, third Star Talk book in collaboration with Nat Geo. So one of them is science, another is pop culture, and the third is humor. And what we found is when you braid these three, 
mm-hmm. and people smile because the humor makes them smile. They come back for more. And then you, the pop culture part, everybody walks in with a pop culture scaffold and it's common for most people. That's why it's called pop culture. And I say, wait a minute, we can take the science and attach it into mm-hmm. that slot. And then I don't have to train you to know the pop culture up to that point. You will absorb it much more readily and you'll walk forward with science now mattering in your life rather than birthing it from whole, you know, stitching it from mm-hmm. whole cloth without knowing why it's relevant or whether it would even make you smile. So this book uses those tactics and tools to take you on a journey from Earth's surface to the edge of the universe as explored by the human spirit, the mind, body, soul, and technology of being human, right? Just think about it. If it's 300 years ago and you're standing flat-footed looking up, you say, how would you get to the moon? How would you? We have no idea. You need something called rocket fuel. Well, what is rocket fuel? Well, you need a rocket. What's a rocket? Well, I have a sailing ship. Maybe I'll figure out hot air and a balloon will rise. Well, does air go all the way to the moon? Can I? So, so they're the fit. Icarus started this. All right. And, and do you give up? Get back to Wendy's point. The, the wings melt. Do you give up at that point that nah, this is impossible? Or do you say, let me make possibly make wings out of a different material and try that? So the book is 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 ripe with the fits and starts of our ascent from Earth to the through the air, through space, to the moon. To, and beyond that, we haven't gone with our physiology, but our robots have. And so that these robotic emissaries continue. Not all of them have succeeded. Many of them have failed. And along the way, there's a scenery. And the scenery are movie movies that we've all seen or heard about. And some of these movies are trying to do what we're talking about. And so I take a step over and I say, here's how the here's what the movie got right. And here's what the movie got wrong. And that's the Mm -hmm. pop culture part of this that keeps you attached to the narrative as we go to infinity and beyond. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, by the way, so that that scene with that scene with with, with, with Spock. okay? that's the that's did did you know for a Uh while there was a planet Vulcan in the solar system? It was a planet closer to the sun than Mercury that we presumed was there, but did not yet discover because Mercury's orbit was not following Newton's laws. So there's got to be another planet tugging on it. Then Einstein invents the general theory of relativity, shows that, in fact, Newton's laws begin to fail in the presence of strong gravity like the sun, and you don't need planet Vulcan. So Einstein destroyed planet Vulcan. That's what that storyline is there. And we have to throw in Spock, of course. You got to throw that in there. <laughs> you had to throw Spock <laughs> one in there. Um, because, I mean, the Incredible Hulk is also in here as well, y'all. Like everything, if you're thinking about pop culture, it's in here. But I do want to do a quick little thing because you mentioned Icarus. And the funny thing is that in this book, you actually, you know, you take the story of Icarus to task for a bit in a playful way. But you break down why that story, eh, you know, is taking a little bit of, of creative liberties um, in terms of it. Do you mind, like, can well, we get well, just, just like, a couple of few yeah, seconds so there's, um, debunk? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. So they didn't know back then. So I don't want to, you know, get on their case badly. But you've been in airplanes before and you somewhere there's a temperature of the outside air. It's 40 below zero up in the air. OK, so no, Icarus's wings would not have melted. They would have frozen, okay, and possibly crumbled. He's the, the boy's still dead, no matter what. But I'm saying that the assumption that when you ascend <laughs> Earth, the temperature increases is just false. In fact, Earth's air temperature, other than mm. the thermosphere, which gets hot from ozone, uh, down on Earth, the hottest part of Earth's atmosphere is right above Earth's surface because the sun doesn't heat the air. The sun heats Earth's surface. Earth's surface heats the air. Icarus didn't know this. The people who wrote the story didn't know this. But it's Mm. a start. You got to start somewhere. And what hardly anybody writes about are the mistakes, not mistakes of blunder, but just mistakes you just don't know. The mistakes that have been made in the history of science and technology and engineering that later science and technologists knew to not make those mistakes. So I I think we celebrate Mm. those. You know, the Mm. first aeronauts? when they figured out a balloon could lift you up, was a sheep, a duck, and a chicken, okay? 
Where's the praise for those first aeronauts, okay? Who were testing the atmosphere <laughs> to find out, is that something humans should do next? So we do this right on up to, to uh, uh, will we ever travel to the galaxies, to the edge of the universe? Is that farther away, technologically, than getting to the moon when you don't even have the laws of physics to tell you how you would do that? I don't know. I, I, maybe not. And, Pe I, 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 Albert, you said you wanted to to be transported from one place to another. Maybe that's not necessary because we invent wormholes. A wormhole is a wormhole between you and the and the mm. planet you're visiting. You just step through. I don't have to turn you into a particle beam and say, no, just step through the wormhole. So certain discoveries could render other thoughts completely obsolete. And this book is an exploration of the thoughts that worked, the thoughts that didn't, right on up to our efforts to travel through time both forwards and backwards, and you know we talk about the movie Back to the Future in that section. Of course. <laughs> yeah. But of course. Now, one of the things that I love is that just by sitting here and sharing this space with the both of you, the connections between these two, like I said, these are two very different books, but the connections become more and more apparent because, Neil, you just discussed how we only learn what to do next based off of like, let's look back and let's actually use what are some of the mistakes that were made before us? What are some of the lessons that we picked up from those who, you know, either failed before us or like tried and succeeded? And then Dr. Okolo and your book, you really are taking the time to go back through your own experiences, but you found a way to really boil them down into essential things that even if someone is not necessarily lined up or dreaming of becoming an engineer, these are things that we can take from your specific life, from your experience, and also apply those into our own discipline. So it really does all connect, y'all. I Look, again, I can't speak objectively here because I've read books and I enjoy them both, but I wouldn't, I recommend that everybody who's watching you just go ahead and you get a bundle, okay? Both of these books are available <laughs> in the carousel. They're in the carousel right next to or below. I'm not trying to push it on you, but if you've got some curiosity, also even if you know someone in your life who is really uh, about to enter a new phase in their life, maybe they're prepping for college, I know back to school is upon us right now, then Learn to Fly might be perfect for them. But in addition, if you are just someone who continues to look up and you're wondering what the heck is going on above us, how can I figure this out without getting a degree in it? Then To Infinity and Beyond is something that you really might want to go ahead and add to your bookshelf as well. So we've got about four minutes left. I want to see the rest of the time um, to questions from viewers uh, who are chiming on in here. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can get like one more good question from a viewer in here. Ba, 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 ba. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, this is one from Avinia. So Vinya wants to know, uh, Vinya says, there's always an expansion in space. The universe is expanding into a void. How was this void created? Oh my gosh, I asked you a, a, a tough question. Oh no, no, I, was, um, I can answer it simply. Here, I, but can, can we... Uh, we don't know. Okay, okay. next question. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, so, so I was, I, I was, I was, I was on a plane uh, two days ago from... What, you know, I went to Southern Italy for a holiday and was coming back and I watched your episode, um, Neil, that was on like the magic of light and talking about the mm. realization of the confusion between light being a particle versus a wave. And you said something that just really resonated with me and you said it would pretty much be foolish of us to assume that we understand nature in its entirety. And I thought about, I mean, even till date, this is 2023, and there's still debates about how lift is generated on an airplane. There are different camps of Bernoulli versus Newton. And I just found out this year because I'm doing a documentary. I did a shot of documentary that's coming out later this year. I just found out that there are these two different camps and we still don't get it. Pilots believe one thing, aerospace engineers and professors in academia believe another. So it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to not know, but- And, and Wendy, I, I posted- I, that I, curiosity, I, you know? Wendy, I posted, I think it was a TikTok, something mm -hmm. short about how planes gain lift. And I mentioned yeah. bits from both camps, you know, the Bernoulli effect yeah. and, the, and the aerospace yeah. and, the, and the attack angle and all of this. And yeah. 
each side attacked it for not being completely the answer that they yeah. wanted it to yeah. be. And so that was just yeah. kind of fun to be in the middle of it. Yeah. And, and I got pretty <laughs> mangled in there, but it was, it was it was fun to watch that unfold. Exactly. It just, it's, yeah. it's yeah. mind blowing. And there are just all these, I was like, what? I didn't know this was a thing, but long story short, and, and so, there are pressure as, as differences a, and velocity differences. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just as a scientist in, at the end of the day, <laughs> We must learn to love the questions themselves. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Mm. Agreed completely. Mm. Curiosity, Every the questioning. Sometimes just, you know, I tell people being, you know, an aerospace engineer doesn't mean you have to know it all. Sometimes no, I just mean you have the right questions. That's it. That's it. Mm. Okay. Well, I hope I hope that you feel like we've had the right questions for both of you today. Uh, because this has been such a blast. Um, Dr. Okolo, I know that you said you're working on a documentary. Um, is there anything else coming up next from you that you care to yeah, tell Yeah, I right need now? to take the time to make Learn to Fly an audiobook with the copious amounts of free time I have. I'm going to get around to mm. it one of these days. And um, I put the the, uh, <laughs> the pre-order for the ebook out as well. And that's on the carousel. The paperback is ready to go. The ebook will be coming out sometime next month. Um, but all I want to do is remind people that if they want to connect with me, you know, my socials are there and you can always go on wendyacolo.com. And most importantly, it's just critical to remember in whatever space you are that everything is for everyone. I don't know if you can see my shirt, right? Um, and let, mm -hmm. let that drive you, let that drive the determination. That there's usually a way out, right? And everything's for everyone. This is on wendyacolo.com as well. But I'm just Wendy, that's happy not very to colonistic. Here. Wendy, that's not very colonistic or capitalistic. It's... What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little colonistic. Is, a colon, yeah. You want to be a colonist? You say, "Is that yours? Yeah. It's mine now." <laughs> that's colonist. It's, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. So, that, no, but this has been great, uh, yeah. Neil. Beautiful. It's, 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 been, it's been a pleasure, and Albert. I don't think we've so met before. Time. Before this moment, is that right? I think we, we have met. not. We have not met. Yeah, yeah. But so we'll, be we'll catch up with you at some point. Sometimes. Sure. Yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. it's, Excellent. Excellent. And it is a beautiful, your book is beautiful. It's yes. Oh, yes right. <laughs> yeah. and, and actually along those lines too, then, um, Neil, I know that so much has gone into the creation of this book. Um, is there anything else that you want us to be keeping an eye or an ear out for that well, you're working thanks on? Thanks for that. There's always something and in this moment. Yes. Uh, actually served as an executive producer on a documentary. Mm -hmm called Shot in the Arm, which is an exploration of vaccine hesitancy and its origins and how to combat that, to have a sort of a healthy contract between each other, be between all of us and civilization for what is otherwise collectively called public health. I was brought onto that project to help it communicate the science through, because that's not my field, it, you know, uh, vaccines are not my field, but communicating science, I would count as something I do. And I helped the director, Scott Hamilton Kennedy, shape the messaging so that it would it would not simultaneously carry compassion for those who who were sort of swayed by the forces that would have them doubt vaccines, but also, um, you know, give people restore people's confidence in what the system is that's trying to keep us alive. And a fast thing, there's uh, there's a comic with two cavemen talking to each other across the fire. And one says, I don't understand it. The air, we, the air, our air is clear. The water is clean. Our, our food is free range. Yet we're still dying at 35. What's wrong? <laughs> so science and modern <laughs> medicine is, is transforming this world. So that documentary has a, uh, a premiere uh, in November. And then it'd be considered for, um, it'll be uh, in the running for, to be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary. We hope if people like it, but uh, it's, it's not available yet, but you can look for it. Shot in the Arm is a great title. Wow. Phenomenal. Okay. So everybody make sure that we keep both of those documentaries. Um, Wendy, what's the title of your documentary? Check what's on the out. title? So it well, is about supersonic airline travel and nice. that race. So you'll, Love you'll um, yeah, I'll share more info when it, when it's, when it's out. You don't have a title? No, a not title? that I know of, <laughs> oh, but it, okay. it is a supersonic race um, documentary. Yeah. 
nice, a little more nice. arrow than space. Yes, yes. There you go. There you go. And Albert, thank you for taking us on, taking That's us on way. this afternoon. Oh, I, I appreciate it. Like, I mean, honestly, I'm just eating my metaphorical popcorn while just basking in the presence of both of you right now. Um, yeah, no, no, this, this, this is great. Um, you know what? Like, but here's here's one thing. Um, I was going to wrap us up, but if you guys have like one extra minute, um, there is one question that I want to ask because uh, when you brought up wormholes, now that's just kind of, that's a whole other thing that we didn't touch on now. I'm curious. Do you think that wormholes actually exist here on Earth? Like, like, is it how close, how realistic is that possible? No, no, that we, we don't know that they exist. We haven't seen travel. any. There's no evidence for it. But we can create a wormhole mathematically. All the, the, the gravitational physics and general relativity is there for you to make a wormhole. But what you need is some mystical, magical substance that has negative energy density, negative gravity, so that you can pry open the fabric of space-time mm -hmm. rather than do what gravity normally does and matter normally does, which is collapse it down on itself. So here I am telling you we need this mythical, mm -hmm. magical substance that nobody knows anything about. Is that any different from going back to the year 1700 and say, you can get to the moon, but we need this magical substance called rocket fuel, and they look at you like, what do you, what's wrong with you? So I don't want to rule out the how mm. beyond infinity it sounds to create a wormhole to someone 200 300 years from now looking back oh those folks back in the year 2023 what did they know so that's you know so what that that's means? why it means when you got that <laughs> answer in capitalist that said you have negative mass you might not have been as wrong as you thought mm. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Ooh. Oh my goodness! See, y'all make a brother want to go sign oh, yeah, up for another calculus class. Go back to that calculus class. This is wild. Go um, back. <laughs> I got a quick thing. I know we're well, way well over time. A quick thing. Oh, a quick thing on the subject of wormholes. I was in the Charlotte Airport, going from a big plane to a little plane, and I was carrying all my luggage, and but it didn't have wheels, and I felt like I walked three miles. It was probably only one mile, but it felt like three miles. I get to the gate, and I thought I'd be clever geek, and I tweeted can't wait till we have wormholes that way all gates will be adjacent to one another so i said that's a pretty good tweet i thought for myself <laughs> until someone geekier than me <laughs> tweeted dr tyson the day we have wormholes you won't need airports oh! mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I got out geek. In oh movie. gosh! Uh, hey, look, and it's it's funny because I know, I know that you two were being very present, so you couldn't take a look in the chat the whole time. Um, but I believe that you two may have also been out geeked in the chat today because they had so many strong questions, so much great insight. So I do want to take this moment. Let's clap it up for everybody who joined us live. Um, there's been so much love that they've been sharing for both of you, doctors, um, and also. Folks that are watching, once more, please don't forget to check out Learn to Fly by Dr. Wendy A. Okolo, okay? And also, of course, To Infinity and Beyond by Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, both of these available in the carousel right now. Click that follow button for even more notifications when it comes to author live series Q&As. And also, click the carousel to follow our author pages today so that you can get updates for their latest works Thank you again so much, both of you, for joining us. Once more, friends, Dr. Wendy A. Okolo and Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. All right? Have a fantastic rest of your days. And get to reading, friends. Get to reading. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.